So my name is Matt. Uh, I work in Canberra at a place called Vix Verify. Um, we do identity verification, biometrics type stuff, and it's not as exciting as that sounds. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about a few tools that we use, um, namely TestFlight, TestFerry, Jenkins, and Splunk. These are all things that hopefully you can use or um, find other tools that do a similar job that will make your code more robust and make your app better for your users. Um, but first, in uh, past dev worlds, etc., I've done talks on exciting things like um, putting augmented reality into your app or how to build a distortion pedal for your electric guitar. Um, this one's about logging and testing. I'm really sorry. <laughs> also, I use Objective-C. <laughs> if you're used to your code examples in Swift, then I'm, I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> Let's dive in. So, unit testing. Who does unit testing in their app at the moment? That's most people. Excellent. I don't really need to tell you about this then, but I will. Um, Xcode has built-in capabilities for unit testing, which is lovely. Um, if you work on other platforms, such as um, one that starts with A and ends in Nthroid, um, you may find that, shockingly, they don't have this built into the ID. You have to find libraries that do it for you. So be very thankful for Xcode. Uh, if you've not set up unit testing before and you didn't tick the little box that's on by default saying, make me some unit tests when you set up your project, you can go into your project and make a new target. And there's some there for unit testing and UI testing. So it's really easy to set up. What makes a good unit test? Um, here we have something where we're passing in a string and it's going to spit out a UI color. And we've tested the code. So great, job done. Um, we ran the test and the function didn't completely crash, so obviously it's working perfectly. Um, not so. So that was the exciting bit of the talk. I had that shimmer effect. Um, so what you actually want to do is run the code, get the answer out of the code that ran, and then verify it against um, what you think the answer should be. And that's what testing should be. You can also test your code by passing in absolute rubbish and making sure it doesn't freak out. So this is all the basics of unit testing. Hopefully you've already done this. Um, yeah. Code coverage. This is another nice little thing in Xcode. So when you run your unit tests, you can get it to tell you which bits of your code got tested and which bits didn't. Um, to turn it on, it's actually hidden away. You have to edit the scheme that you're running. And in the little test thing, you tick the box that says code coverage. Now you can get the code coverage for your whole app. Um, sometimes you'll find that you've imported some CocoaPods or other frameworks. You obviously don't want to get code coverage information about them. So you can just tell it to gather the coverage for the bits that you're interested in. Um, once you turn that on, after you run your tests, you click on the little speech bubble icon, which is called the report navigator, apparently. And hidden away in there is the code coverage report. So you can see down the side here, it's telling us how much of our code was tested in each of the classes. You can click on the little drop down arrows to um, tell you which functions you haven't tested yet, and then you know where to um, direct your efforts when you're writing your tests. Uh, when you turn this on, it also adds a little colored sidebar down the side of your uh, code editing, editing windows. So anything that hasn't been tested the last time you ran your test will have a little red bar next to it. That's what's going on there. Um, and don't try and get 100% in everything. It may be pointless. Um, you can see here, we've only tested uh, two thirds of the code in that class. It's because it's a loading view. We don't really care. It's not that important. Um, think about where you want to spend your effort when you're writing unit tests. If there's something that's really critical to your application and maybe it's broken before, that's where you want to spend your time. So that was the built-in stuff in 
Xcode. Um, I'm going to look at a cool, a cool little tool called Jenkins now. Um, it's a continuous integration tool. You can use it for doing all sorts of stuff like building your code. You can also use it for running your unit tests and your UI tests. Um, I believe it's free, so that's good. You set it up on a machine and it acts as a server. Then you can connect to it via a web browser from your other machines. So you can set it up to do things like um, every time you commit code um, to your repository, it can check out the new code, automatically run your tests, and fire off an email if um, the tests are failing. You can also chain it together so it can do things like when you're ready to, to do a uh, code release, you press the magic button and it'll check out your latest code, run all the tests. If the tests all pass, then it'll build your app. If the build is successful, it can upload it to your distribution thing. So that really enforces uh, running your tests and you can't forget to run your tests, which we often do. So this is what it looks like. You have different uh, little jobs that you can run and they can chain together, as I said. Got cute little graphics um, showing how often things have been running successfully. The setup is pretty easy. It's a nice uh, GUI interface. So you can type in your Git repository details and it will know how to pull out all of that code. If you've got weirdo sort of uh, scripts that you need to run as part of your build process, it can do that. You can just type in whatever you like, arbitrary shell commands. And it understands everything about Xcode build, which is great because now you can get it to run your test targets and all of that sort of stuff. Um, it also knows about Android development, so it can build all of your Android app as well. Do we have anybody here who actually does Android as well as iOS? One, two, two people, awesome. Um, now, with Xcode running your tests, you, you get that instantaneous count of how many tests pass and fail, which is okay. When you're running it through Jenkins, it remembers things. So we can see here that every time we've run a build, um, it's done a count of how many tests passed and failed. The failures are the little tiny red lines down the bottom. Um, you can see a big hole in the graph where somebody accidentally changed the branch. Um, so it wasn't running the tests anymore. But you do get this um, lovely graph, which if any of you are in an organization large enough to have things like project managers or business analysts, this is the kind of stuff that they really love because they can see progress over time um, and it documents what's going on. Um, so this will keep the project managers off the coders' backs, which is really what we're all about. So for each test, you get um, a report. You can see how many have passed and failed, and you can click on the failures to go into the logs, read all about it. Um, Jenkins also has plugins for all sorts of other tools, so here's one that does the code coverage for us. And again, we've got a lovely graph showing that over time, as we've added tests, the number of lines in our project that we're covering with our unit tests has gone up. Again, this um, means that the project managers and business analysts will stay off your back. So this is great. Um, so that was Jenkins. We're going to dive into beta testing now. This is all about getting your code out to real people. Has everybody here used TestFlight? Kinda, yep. Um, so we'll have a quick look at that. And another one that we use called TestFerry. So TestFlight is the Apple provided one. It's on whatever they're calling iTunes Connect this week. Um, Anybody else find that really weird that they changed the name, but it still says iTunes Connect in the URL? Yeah, funny. Um, so users install the TestFlight app on their phone, and you can push out beta versions of your app, and they test it. Pretty simple. Um, anybody here annoyed how Apple has to do a beta review of your app every time you put a new one up? 
Yep. So we'll get to that in a minute because there's a way around that. It's really sneaky. Um, so test ferry is a different uh, system that you can use. This one lets you distribute your iOS and Android apps. Um, it uses the ad hoc provisioning profile, which means it's a little bit limited because there's only 100 devices that Apple lets you have in your profile every year. So that's a little bit sucky. But where it's good is that it has built in video recording of what the user is doing. So if your beta testers are a remote site, um, then you'll get a video showing exactly what they did on the screen and where they touched and what they saw. It also has the, all of the logs from the device. Um, as your app is running, if you're doing print statements, then you'll get all of those. And if your app crashes, then it will notify you. Um, it has plugins so that you can plug it into your Slack. Um, and you get that wonderful adrenaline rush when you see that the Test Ferry channel has a new message because you think, oh shit, the app's just crashed again. It's easy to integrate. Um, you just drop in a CocoaPod or a drop in their framework. So we can see here some of our builds. Um, yep, so build 317 crashed. And then you can see that an hour later we quickly put out a fix. So go team. Right, for each of those builds, you can drill down and you can see every time the build was run, what phone it was run on. And then for each of those test runs, you get uh, the video showing exactly what they saw. You get a nice little timeline um, which shows the view controllers that were on the screen at any one time and where they were touching. You get uh, the full console log of your app running, which is really, really handy for um, debugging your problem if you've got good logging in there, which we'll talk about in a minute. <coughs> and you get some high quality screenshots uh, once per second of what was on the screen. Um, this is also really handy because if the, the beta tester is being a bit vague about what they did to make the phone catch on fire, you can actually scroll through and find the bit where they press the catch on fire button and then you know what they did. Um, so when trying to decide whether to use test ferry or test flight, um, you can actually just use both. So you can integrate the test ferry framework into your app. So that will do all of the video recording and log gathering and crash reporting for you. And then you can just upload that onto test flight and let Apple distribute that for you. There's the anvil. <laughs> Why not both? <laughs> um, so for those of you who don't like the test flight beta review where you've got to wait hours, maybe a day for Apple to review your app, this is the way around it. Um, if you've got a set release date for your beta testing, the week before you upload an app with the same version number. So the version number is this one in Xcode. Um, then when you're ready to actually upload the proper one, a week later or days later, you upload one with exactly the same version number that you just increment the build number. Um, Apple doesn't do a review if the version number hasn't changed, so they review your kind of ready app a week ago, and then you upload the proper one, and they'll just let it straight through. So that's the way to get around that. Um, we use that all the time because we used to have um, set release dates for our testing, and then we'd forget to upload it to test flight in time. And then they'd send out the email saying the thing's ready to test and it's not ready to test because Apple has to review it. And everybody would get stressed. So this is a good way around that. Uh, so you saw with the test ferry that we can gather the logs. So let's talk about logging. Now, you can just use NSLog or print. That's fine. Um, we can do better things though. We can add in some log levels, so the severity for each log message. We can add in some timing and profiling information. We can add in some key value information into our logging. And um, we can even send all of the logging to a remote server. Um, all of these things make our logging 
consistent, and that's a good thing when you're trying to debug a problem. Um, don't do this. Don't write logging like this, just don't. Um, don't log angry is a, another way I like to think of it. <laughs> so log levels. Um, this is something that's been around on other platforms for forever. Um, so each message can be classified as having a severity. So it might be an error or a warning or just some info or maybe some debugging that you don't want other people to see or verbose when you've got reams and reams of text that you're trying to really work out what's going wrong. Um, so the idea here is that you can turn off the verbose stuff. Usually turn it on when you need it, when there's something going wrong. You can filter your messages based on the severity. Um, and to do this, we can grab a framework, something like Lumberjack, some of the others there, or you can just build your own class to do the logging for you, which is actually not as hard as it sounds. So you might um, implement some methods that do the logging for you, change all of your print statements to one of these based on how severe you think that logging line is, and then just have a method to set your logging level, let your code work out what it needs to print. Um, so let's add some more things. We can add logging to tell us when the user started a particular thing in your app and when they finished. Uh, if we do that, we can have some timing in there and we can work out how long parts of your workflow take. We can have logging that tells, uh, tells us when any network interactions happened. And so we can work out how long it takes to gra uh, grab something off the network or how long it takes to send. Um, we can also have some standardized logging on the UI interactions with the user. So we can log when they touch the screen, uh, depending on your app, that may be a good idea or not. And maybe some logging about what, what the user is actually seeing on the screen at any one time when you change view controllers. So it's pretty easy to implement. You need a function to, uh, to say when you started doing a task and another one to say when you end doing a task. Then in your uh, implementation of that, you'll have some timers and things like that. Um, this is not necessarily just measuring when you're starting a particular function in your app. It's more about the workflow. So the start and the end might be in completely different places in your app or in callbacks or completion handlers, things like that. If you're lucky enough to be able to target iOS 10 and above in your app, um, Apple has actually provided a new way of doing your logging called OS Log. Um, this is on Swift and Objective-C and C. And it has all of the logging levels built in. And with iOS 12, which is coming out soon, has all those timing functions built in as well. And that integrates really, really nicely with uh, instruments. So you can um, drop in some, it's called OS task or something, can't remember. Um, drop them into your app and they don't really take any time to run when you're running your app on your phone. Then if you hook it up to instruments, it'll um, activate those logging points and you get these wonderful graphs showing how long parts of your app are taking. It's really cool. Uh, another technique that we're using is key value pair logging. So rather than just logging random text strings, um, we make everything a key value pair. This makes things really consistent when you're logging in your app. Um, you can also use this as input to other systems. So as an example, we're logging that we're starting to load a web page, and then we're logging a dictionary with some key value pairs, so the URL of the thing that we're loading. And you can obviously log lots of things. So here's a bigger example. Um, this is when our app captures an image from the user's phone. So we're saying, okay, we're finished capturing the image. And then we want to record all the things about the image that we've captured. So we just send them all through um, in a dictionary that has the key values. What we can do then is send that all to a remote logging server that understands key value pairs. Um, so the tool that we're using is Splunk. I think that's a paid product. They've got a free demo. I'm not sure if they've got a free 
uh, limited product. You can check that out. Um, this is a really good product uh, if you've got uh, an app that needs to do logging and also some backend servers or cloud servers that are doing parts of your workflow because they can all log to Splunk. And then you get the, uh, the whole session for the user with the front end and the app and the back end logging all in the same place, which is really good. Um, it has a really powerful language for querying all of your logs, so it's kind of like an SQL type thing. And it does all of the pretty graphs. Um, I've spent many a day just sitting there drawing graphs in Splunk. It's good fun. So once we, send the, uh, once we log those key value pairs, Splunk knows how to pull those apart and each uh, log message gets displayed nicely like this. You can turn on, on and off the keys that you want to see at the particular point in time. And it will spit out a lovely table of your logs. Uh, it can also do reporting when things happen at a particular time. So um, you can set up a report in Splunk to say, um, send me an email when the one millionth customer starts my app and it will do that when that happens. Um, and what it's also good for is analytics. So who here uses, uh, say, Google Analytics in their app to record things? Yeah, a few people. Okay. Um, you can do similar things in Splunk. The reason we use it at our work is because we have lots of uh, server stuff as well, and that's all hooked into Splunk really nicely, so we wanted the app to be logging to the same place. Um, so all of the stuff that we've just been working on for logging is also useful for the analytics side of it. Um, so we're logging all of the information from our app, we're logging when things start and end, and we're logging when the user is doing things on the screen, so we can use all of that. Um, so here's an example in Splunk. Our workflow in our app does five things. And we can get the information from the logging about how many times the users have run those things and the average time that it took in seconds for each of those parts of the workflow. It gets really interesting when you've also got the build number of your app as part of your key values because now you can say before, say, build 200, how long did it take to do the thing? And then after we made some changes in build 201, how long is it taking now? And those are real numbers. It used to take 12 seconds with a standard deviation of 14. And now it takes 2.9 seconds. So again, we can go back to our business analysts and our project managers and say, hey, look, we're doing our job. We've fixed the app. And you've got real numbers and go, yay, science. Um, as I said, it can do all sorts of pretty graphs of um, what's going on in your app. When a user has to make a choice, um, you can log what choice they make and then Splunk can display that in a nice way for you. You can look at um, how performance changes for each build of your app. So here we've got um, the time it was taking to do something in each build of the app. And you can see build 270 for some reason suddenly that took a lot more time. So we don't know what actually went wrong there, but um, that's obviously something that we want to look into. How are we going for time? Uh, about five minutes. Cool. Um, the last word on the analytics is remember, just don't be creepy. Um, you don't want to log personally identifying information of your users. Um, don't log their unique device ID of their hardware. Um, remember that your beta testers are real people, so you, know, you don't want to log all of their stuff when you don't have to. Um, keep in mind that that video logging and text logging might contain personal stuff, so keep that in mind. Um, treat it as you would want your own private information to be treated. Um, make sure you're in compliance with any privacy policies that you have. Um, 
and hopefully you've got one for your app. And don't put that test very video recording in your live shipping app on the App Store, because that would be just creepy. All right, um, links, take a photo if you need those. I'll leave that up on the screen. Um, and that's about it for me. So I can take some questions, I guess.